for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, good evening, Fade to Black. A very special Friday night presentation. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, and tonight we are celebrating Linda Moulton Howe. And we are going to get straight to it. Today is Friday, March 24th. And uh, Linda, of course, is Earth Files. She's been at this for five decades. It's crazy. But that's not what's most important. What's most important is... Linda has traveled to Venezuela, Peru, Brazil, England, Norway, France, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Yugoslavia, Turkey, Ethiopia, Kenya, Egypt, Australia, Japan, Canada, Mexico, the Yucatan, and Puerto Rico for her research and productions. Her website, of course, is earthfiles.com, and I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Linda Moulton Howe. Good evening, young lady. All right. It's great to be back with you and hear all those countries that I have had such great times in. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to, uh, uh, let me do this. Okay, um, Linda, yeah, are you going to add another country anytime soon? Well, let's see. Um, I may be going to England later this year, and uh, but... I, we're still in that, what do you call it, that psychological thing where traveling like we used to do so easily is not something that anybody is enthusiastic in the new world that we're in post-pandemic and so many problems when you travel. Well, I'm thinking Antarctica. I think you need to add Antarctica to the list. <laughs> well, I have been there in a way when I did that documentary with Spartan 1 and Spartan 2 and they uh people are waving at me do you know that are they there with you yeah of course <laughs> okay um and uh they were uh like a military insight into what we've heard rumors about that antarctica two to three miles underneath that big huge mound of ice is someone's very amazing three square acre rooms, 80 foot ceilings, thousands of various kinds of carvings, like you would think of something between Mayan and Egyptian, all in black rock. And when I uh, was filming with them and working with them, we brought up a question that started uh, all the way back in 2017. I was working with them on Spartan, it was Spartan 1 and 2 in 2018. So the year before in 2017, I did at earthfiles.com, a muamua, comet, asteroid, other, changing speed and course. And when I, the next year, when I'm working with Spartan 1 and 2, they tell me that they know that it was identified by what we would consider to be military intelligence in the United States as an alien technology, like a craft. Okay, so that's 2018 working with Spartan 1 and 2. In 2019, it was Professor Avi Loeb at Harvard, who at the time was the director of the astronomy department. Uh, at Harvard, the longest serving director of the astronomy department. And he put forth for the first time a hypothesis that this was, a muamua was an example of some kind of, let's say, discarded alien technology that had made its way into our or near our solar system. And that one of the astounding things about it, which provoked that, is 
and I'm quoting from my own Earth Files report back in uh, 2017 and 2018 when this uh, came through. Quote, it was pulled by the sun's gravity, apparently, because the object made a hairpin turn under our solar system, passing under Earth's orbit on October 14th, 2017, at a distance of about 15 million miles and about 60 times the distance of we were standing on the Earth looking at the moon. It was 60 times further away. And then this object, Amuamua, shot back up above the plane of our solar system planets and its speed, Jimmy, the speed of Amuamua at this point begins increasing up to 97,200 miles an hour. That's 27 miles a second. And that was in respect to the distance it was traveling from our sun. And it left our solar system still speeding toward the constellation Pegasus, Pegasus. But there was no identifiable reason from scientists about why it would have started increasing so much. There became science uh, arguments about whether, what was it made of? Uh, could this have been evaporating gases? And there was no evidence of any of that. No, that's right. And, and, uh, and uh, But Linda, uh, the, uh, for me, one of the crucial, there's like 20 different uh, amazing things about Oumuamua, but um, it went... And, and increased speed to over 250,000 miles per hour. Well, that, the last figure that I had is the one I quoted, 97,200. Yeah. It, what, whichever they decided was correct, it was a speed increasing without explanation in terms of gravita gravity. Yeah. And, no, oh, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying, Linda, I don't want to interrupt you on the night that we're celebrating you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, no, yeah, you, you're correct. Except it, it it accelerated and accelerated and accelerated, and after eleven days, uh, when it was uh, you know virtually out of sight, and that was it. It was uh, over two hundred and fifty thousand miles per hour without gravity assist, and you yeah. just have to just stop right there and go. Uh, somebody just explain this to me like I'm a five year old because this this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and then within uh, a few months. It was Professor Avi Loeb at Harvard who hypothesized, and it was published, that this was, in fact, an artificial intelligence, that this was some kind of craft. And for the whole last year and a half or so, maybe two years, <clears throat> there's been a lot of uh, argument about whether or not it could actually have been something that was structured. It would be the first known other intelligence created object identified if it came to that. Mm -hmm. But recently, uh, just in the last uh, couple of days, there has been a counter presentation by scientists who are arguing that it is a natural uh, increase in speed from what they are hypothesizing, not proving, but hy hypothesizing various kinds of gases that increased as and then kept increasing. So we now have this argument again between scientists about what a muamua could have been. Yeah. But this, yeah. yeah, but, uh, yeah and it, but it leads to this issue of that around us more and more in so many directions, in many countries, there are now more and more papers and discussions among scientists than ever before about whether or not there are signs, evidence, physical traces of other intelligences that if we were looking with open scientific mind into the solar system around us, that we might find more. That's what Avi Loeb would like us to be looking for. Well, I was uh, in my Earth Files YouTube channel. I was talking about this uh, facet and some others. And I got an email that came from a man who today is 64 years old, retired. But he had served in the United States Air Force uh, and was uh, at Upper Hayford, 
which is very close to Oxford in England and about 137 miles to the west of RAF Bentwaters. And RAF Bentwaters is on the east coast of England, very close to the ocean. And in between, that was the distance between Upper Hayford and Bentwaters. And okay. why is this important? This is one of the more amazing eyewitness military stories <clears throat> that uh, I think has ever come with so many pieces that begin to fit together and you see a bigger picture than you ever saw over the last 30 or 40 years in my case. And the, he sends me this email and we have a, a safe way to communicate and I interview him for a very long time. And on December 26th, 27th, 28th, 1980, those three dates have been reported since about 1983, 82, when one of the, uh, I think it's uh, the World News uh, in London, did a report about strange lights in the Wendelsham Forest near RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge and that there had been multiple eyewitnesses. And that is the story that for going all the way back to uh, somewhere in the 80s, I met John Burroughs, began helping him find people to do hypnosis. These many decades later, we have heard from dozens and dozens and dozens of U.S. Air Force uh, people who were at RAF Bentwaters the nights of December 26th, 27th, and 28th. Colonel Halt, Charles Halt, who was deputy base commander on the night of the 28th, was even out there when a beam came down from a light and hit the ground three feet from his shoe. Mm -hmm. And those three nights haunted John Burroughs. I've known John now for a few decades. And the thing about it is that he had pieces that he could remember. But when we would do hypnosis, trying to find out what exactly happened to him on the night of the 26th, the 27th, the 28th, there were these gaps, except that on the third night, the 28th, it wasn't just John Burroughs and Jim Pennison. It was Colonel Charles Halt and 12 or 14 men, and they were all out in the forest, all of them. And they all were watching beams coming down from lights in the sky, all of them. And they were talking with each other. And a, a Colonel Halt was recording all of the uh, what he was saying and what they were saying. And then John Burroughs and uh, Sergeant Adrian Bastinza, John sees a light as they all see a light that seems to be somewhere close to the ground. And John, as if drawn there, starts walking. Adrian Bastinza was assigned by Hall to stay with John, comes running up next to Burroughs. John is getting closer and closer to this strange light that is a bizarre oval egg shape. And the thing that Adrian Bastinza told me that he saw right next to and slightly behind John. He said, light. It was light, Linda. It was like John was going into light, perhaps a beam pulling him up right at that moment. And then Adrian said, and something, Linda, something like took hold of me. Nobody was around me, but something took hold of me and pushed me to the ground. And as I went down to the ground by whatever is pushing me, I looked up again and John was up in the air in the light. Okay, so now that's a very fast summary of just a couple of facets that happened at RAF Bentwaters December 26th, 27th, and 28th. And and in so this, well, in, in, this, me, in this email that's come to me, that's what I was gonna. I, I would just want to clarify for the audience. So uh, the events uh, at Woodbridge uh, slash Bentwater slash Reynoldsham Forest, <laughs> those dates: 27, 28, 29, 1980. Uh, we've got uh, uh, the Christmas parties going on. We've got a New Year's Eve party going on. 
Colonel Halt's attending that. The lights return. He gets pulled out. He gets thrown into the force, and everything just breaks loose for a third night. But that was on the coast. You on the, just yes, got, East Coast. You just got an email uh, from a location about 150 miles to the west. Uh, 137 uh, miles. 100. Man, you're so you're so precise. Yes. I don't even. You know have to be. You yeah. have to be as precise as you can possibly be <laughs> when you are covering these kinds you're of so subjects. Pre- I, I think it's I think it's that Christmas sweater that you're wearing. It, 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 <laughs> it snowed fine- off and on all day here in Albuquerque. It, it fine tunes your frontal lobe. Okay, right. so now you yeah. get this email two two three days ago. Uh, what happened? Well, further a couple of weeks ago, and I was able to talk with this individual at great great length and record him on the middle night at RAF Bentwaters, unbeknownst to anybody there at the time, apparently. And then over to the west, 137 miles to Upper Hayford. That is also an American base, but the, in the United States and England and the way they would describe it, that's RAF, Royal Air Force. It's American, but they go by RAF, Upper Hayford, RAF, Bentwaters, RAF Crowden is just a few miles north of Upper Hayford, and it is a radar base. That is what it excels in. And I now have a man who is talking to me, being from the United States, based at RAF Upper Hayford, who starts unfolding how he gets an order to go out to one of the weapon storage areas at Upper Hayford in order to move bombs to protect them, and nobody tells him why. He gets to the weapon storage area, and it is the night of December 27th, 1980, at approximately on the dot, 1 a.m. So over in Bentwaters, Mm -hmm. on that middle night, they're out, people are out in the forest and it's the clock goes past midnight. So you've gone from 26 to the 27th. And that is the two RAF bases don't know it, but they are both experiencing very strange, highly strange UFO phenomena. And in upper Hayford, I'll call the, uh, the person that I'm protecting to share his story, that I call him uh, Smith Jones. And he, at that time, was a senior airman. He would eventually, after 20 years, retire from the Air Force as a staff sergeant. And he gets to where he is to do the bombs. They have trailers. He's starting to do work. He is um, on what is called, a, it's a little hill at Upper Hayford. And when you are at the flight line and this little hill here where some of the bombs and and tunneling equipment are, it has a slope like this. And he is looking down on another part of what would be the flight line from where he begins trying to organize how he's going to protect these bombs. And he has not a clue what's happening. He doesn't see anything. He doesn't know why he's there. He's getting a phone call back saying he needs help. He needs somebody to come from security to help. He's made that call. He turns around. He's up on that little hill. He turns around just to look down at this other uh, section of the airfield. And there... It astounded him, struck him. It was like he was hit with something, like lightning. He couldn't believe it. 60 to 80 feet long, 30 to 40, maybe 50 feet wide, the shape of a triangle. And it is just like this in the air below him. He can only see the top of it. It is below him. And he said, I 
do not know how anything that large, how can it creep up? There was no sound, no sound at all. It's just there. And what unfolded over the next few hours, he makes another phone call. He's trying to get security help. He doesn't know what this is. He doesn't know why they are moving bombs. The whole thing is uh, has him stunned. And eventually, two more men show up and they go down the hill. And when they get down a little lower, they're now looking up under the belly of this huge triangular craft that appears to be all black, but in the what we'll call the front, when they uh, could see it were two 10 foot by five foot windows. So here's a 10 by five, here's a 10 by five. They can't see anybody. They don't see any moving lights. They don't see anything functioning except pure white daylight appears to be coming up from the floor. It is directional, as he said to me, and that the light was making the windows look white, but that was it. There was nothing else until the three of them get down below. And then he did drawings and apologized for not being an artist, but the point here is what he saw. I've never heard before or since. He had never heard before or since. There were 19 half moons. Do do like a think of pie and, and cut it in half. Mm -hmm. And 19 halves are placed a line of seven, a line of seven, that's 14, and in what would be the back, five in between. So there's a total of 19, and he said, he, he had never seen anything like it, but he tried to compare it to what would uh, make us see what he was seeing inside of these small, uh, we'll call them, he called them glass orbs. He said, you know what a, a electrostatic electricity looks like, or maybe like lightning. And if you could capture lightning that was red, green, yellow, blue, and a little orange. And he said, if you could capture and you're seeing like lightning inside of these half moons, that's what it was like. And then the more crews are coming. They are getting orders that they are, they, they've got to close this up and uh, they start doing their work. And this uh, thing is right there, still silent, silent. Hmm. And they get doors closed with the bombs moved. They get the work done without still not anybody talking to them about what is going on and what is this thing, this big thing in the air. And the three, he and two of the men go back down to a position where they're underneath they're waiting for a transport to come and get them. And as they sat there, he said, suddenly, not one sound, still not one sound. And yet this huge thing with the 19 lightning glass orbs on the bottom, that it began to turn. And he said it started to turn so slowly that they both, all three of them said, how can it be so big and turn so slowly and we not hear anything? And he said, as it kept turning, it was almost like, this is what we can do. And there's nothing you can do about it. And he said, it actually had that feeling. And all three men said, my God, it's like telling us in the slow sort of almost, uh, we have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to hurry for. And then the, when the craft had turned, it just disappeared. Okay, now he gets, finally he gets back and he's in a briefing and he is trying to tell them what 
he saw and to find out what was happening. And the man, the superior officer said, you are to keep your mouth shut for the rest of your life, or we will make sure that everything in your career is pulled and you will have nothing. And that those are literal words said to him. And he, by that point, like so many people who have experienced this, some dramatic thing with a UFO, and then somebody of higher rank comes and says that you keep your mouth shut or all kinds of pun punishing is going to happen. And he said from that moment on until the sun came up, he had no idea what was happening, but he finally had uh, the ability to talk to some people who were coming in on the new shift before he would go back to his place. And he said, these guys came in and they said, hey, did you hear about the UFO last night? He said, hear about it? I was there. I was underneath it. And they said, well, did you hear? It went up to Crowton. That was RAF Crowton nearby, uh, a little bit further north. And then they've reported it at RAF Bentwaters. Same craft. Brand new information. Yeah, and 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 here's the thing. All right, December 29th, right, 1980. Um, now we have uh, you know Upper Hayford, and Upper Hayford is right in the middle of the United Kingdom too. It's it's just pretty, a little north of Oxford. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's right in the center there. Um, that we've got uh, Bent Waters, Rendlesham, and then over here in the United States, we had Cash Landrum. And yeah. that was also on December 29th, 1980. That's right. And I said to him, what in the world do you suppose was happening the 27th, the, uh, what would be starting up to midnight on the 26th, then you go past midnight and you're into the 27th. Right. You go through the 27th, midnight to the 28th, and then that third night, the 28th, went into the 29th. What was happening that so many places would have had, and this is important, they all said it had to be something like a UFO because they had never seen anything like it that big. There was no noise. It moved as if it was on gliding on ice, uh, still without making noise. And the whole issue of what had showed up in Bentwaters was being had been argued there among so many people over how many decades. Well, here is an insight that the same strange thing that he was seeing at Upper Hayford and that went to Crowton, that it ended up in Bentwaters. But there's never, Jimmy, there has never been any description that I've ever heard of a, a triangle that was just suspended, totally silent in the air, even there. So which came first? Right. Was this craft what brought with it all of the phenomena that was unfolding? That's right. Or was that it attracted to something else that was already at RAF Bentwaters and maybe it had even gone there first and then to Upper Hayford and then to Crowton and back? We don't know because... No one, there was no overview of any of what I've just reported to you guys. There was no overview about that. I'm only getting it for the first time in detail in 2023 March. It, it sounds like, I, I want your opinion on this. Um, from the description of your witness, it sounds like the craft is similar, a bigger version of what Penniston reported. Well, you know, you know what I mean? So maybe maybe they released uh, maybe what uh, appeared in Rendlesham. Of course, I'm just, you know, spitballing here. We're whiteboarding together. But um, maybe I, I can add something that uh, Pettison and I and John worked on illustrations when we were doing stuff for Ancient Aliens and uh, my book and various things. And one, one of the illustrations that Penniston did was, was of a black triangle, but it was only approximately nine feet long uh, 
it was, mm -hmm. I think, seven feet, six, seven feet off the ground. And uh, the, I have an illustration in my Earth Files YouTube channel that was on Wednesday night uh, on the 22nd of this week. You can see that you can see in if you go to the Earth Files YouTube channel and you click on the uh, March 22nd Earth Files YouTube channel, it's the broadcast about uh, what what went to three air bases uh, in the UFO category and that the black triangle uh, doing interviews with Pennison and John for ancient aliens that he remembered that it seemed like it was black glass, solid black glass, but had lights that were red, green, different colors moving underneath the glass. So Wait, it's, 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 the size is not the same, but the idea of light in right. glass. Right, 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 right. And, and, and so going back to your eyewitness, <clears throat> I find it very interesting of the description of the half balls with the electrostatic lightning uh, that was yeah. multicolored. Things are sounding very, very similar here, although they're isolated incidents. And they're different. They really are different because 60 to 80 foot. Try yeah. to imagine that's one quarter of the length of a football field. Sure. That's what is in the air. Only about uh, at one point he thought it was maybe somewhere between 15 and 30 feet above them. Really low. And here are three men standing there looking at this thing. Uh, no briefing, no explanation, and no one ever talked about it except for those three, they talked to each other underneath it. When they got back, they were all told never to discuss it. But doesn't that imply, Jimmy, that our government, our military at some level knew a lot about whatever this large black craft was with the white light in these huge windows with the pulsing electrostatic light underneath. Somebody knew or had some briefing about it or wouldn't there have been just mayhem that there would have been things organized to come to uh, uh, probably to strafe it with bombs. You I mean, yeah, yeah. this implies a lot of knowledge at a high level about something that moved almost casually over three air bases in England that were American bases, December 26th, 27th, 28th. And this was the after midnight on the 27th at Upper Hayford and Crowton and getting to RAF Bentwaters. You know, your research and, and how you get stuff done, Linda, and the way that you approach uh, investigative journalism, this is why um, Parapod is <laughs> is presenting you with the Media Legend Award next week. I and, have, thank and, you. And, 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 and I, again, for those that, that can't be there, uh, this is why we're doing this show tonight, so we can celebrate. Uh, next week, Linda's traveling, I'm traveling, and we won't have an opportunity to do it. But we're doing that tonight. And um, Thanks to I, you. Thank you. Well, you know, the, the thing is, and I've, look, I've presented you with awards in the past, right? One, yeah. of, my, one of my cool moments, uh, I know this sounds uh, just so trivial, um, but... I, uh, one day, this was, I don't know, it was a few years ago, and I was doing some research on you, and I needed I needed something. So I go to your Wikipedia page, right? And I'm just looking for whatever I was looking for. And on the right of the Wikipedia, you don't know this, you don't do your, you know, other people do, but there is a, there's a thing, uh, there's a picture, and it says Jimmy Church presenting Linda Moulton Howe with the Lifetime Achievement Award. And it's you and I. I thought, Brad, life is complete. And it was a Conscious Life Expo. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was so cool. And, and you know, <laughs> and I'm giving you this award. But um, it, it And was I want to take a pill to live for another 500 years. Yeah. I want to keep exploring. <laughs> I want to see how all this comes out. Well, we're we're getting close. We're getting close. Okay, so Linda, um, uh, what 
Uh, we're going to present you uh, with an award, but uh, you're going to get a chance to to speak too. What what do you what are you going to speak about next week? It is one of my most favorite presentations, and I keep adding and evolving from brains to galaxies. The key is frequencies, mm. and the deeper and more scientists that I have talked to people who are in the abduction category, people who are in the military category, the aerospace category, the medical care, uh, category. Frequency. When I was uh, working at Gaia with that Tim from Germany, mm -hmm. and it's called Truth Hunter, and we were doing this series, he was introduced to me as possibly a hybrid working for a department in Germany, deliberately, uh, how to put this, deliberately with deeper knowledge from possibly a genetic connection to Greys and others, and that that would be where I would have the ability to ask him questions and go as deeply as I possibly could. And I think it was the second day because we did uh, interviews for two days. I asked him a question about dimensions and it was like a gear shift. And he went into one of the most intelligent explanations that I've ever heard about the whole issue of everything is frequency connected from the particle level to the macro level. Mm -hmm. And that if we knew the truth about how it is all working together, we would know that we are experiencing consciousness in what is called the third dimension. That there, this is his count, Tim's count, that there are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten total dimensions to this universe. Unless you know about those other seven beyond three we are babies. We right. are kept in a baby perspective. Yeah. Those other dimensions are the big engines. And that what his communication with a particular type of gray that he was communicating with physically in the same room in Germany, humanity needs to get from the third dimension to the fifth dimension and gave all of these complex facet reasons why, that in the third dimension, where we are caught by time, uh, we are caught by deterioration in a very short segment of being born, and then we are supposed to retire from life and die in our 60s or 70s, that this is an artificial three-dimensional existence in order to learn, in order to get to higher dimensions. And that the, the, the Greys told Tim, who was talking to me in A Truth Hunter, that they would like to see humanity be educated to bypass the fourth dimension altogether and get to the fifth, where we would then begin to have information about how all of the frequencies work. And that once you begin to understand the relationship of frequencies from the atomic particle level up to the macro, and you begin to understand that dimensions are separated by frequency, that the systems that work in our bodies at the micro level are separated in many ways by frequencies. That the solar systems and the suns that were in a universe that has an estimated three trillion stars at least, the dynamics inside of this one universe is all related to the frequencies from particle to macro. That if you then go beyond this universe into the concept of the multiverse, you then are what Roger Penrose in that interview I did with him in 2018. When I asked him, sir, what about the singularity that started this universe? And his gentle 
UK voice said, oh, no, Linda, no, no singularity. What we are in is an infinity of cycles of time. All of it woven together, frequencies, frequencies moving through infinity. And we have only a tiny, tiny lens in the third dimension. I find this exciting. I find it exciting to think that at the moment of our passing in the third dimensional matter world, that there is reincarnation of our vital energetic souls that Tim says that, that we don't understand the power of our souls as humans, that we would then go into other reincarnative cycles and we are not the only consciousness doing it. And that all of it, in all of its, Roger Penrose, the infinite cycles of time, all of it, all of it is organized and evolving because frequencies are separating out everything from dimensions to the particles at the, at the smallest level, atomic level, where it all works together in cycles. And somehow I am now beginning to grok that. I'm beginning for the first time to feel that, to have a sense of it. And that's the sadness that we are at 2023. And we humans have still not been told by the power brokers of earth that we're not alone, that there's three trillion stars, there's thousands, millions of other intelligences, and that we are a life form with consciousness in our brains that can resonate with this entire universe if we were taught. And that the universe and all consciousness in this universe are always in a frequency relationship with each other. The uh, the part of this that I, I find so compelling is that our community, those that think outside of the box, you know, that are pursuers of of knowledge, um, it, it, and our community is 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 vastly different. In, in that, some of us are looking at life after death. Some of us are looking at Bigfoot. Some of us are looking at consciousness. Some of us are discussing UFO. Some of us discuss all of that. Uh, and they're like, all facets of the same incredible universe. Point. That's my point. <laughs> you know, that's my point. And so we have been going at this for a very long time, yelling from the treetops, right? And just now, and, and Roger Penrose, who's somebody I've read a lot of his books, and I really appreciate the way that he thinks. Yes. But, but science today, Linda, is talking about all of the things that this community has been shouting about for decades, right? And, and now, finally, they're coming together. You know, when, when, when Brian Green, because we've been talking about 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D, extra dimensions, this and yeah. that. Uh, At for, least uh, 10. Yeah. Some people argue 12. And I that's know, why MJ12 right. was called 12, because there were 12 dimensions and they learned that from E.T. Right. But that's today, right. Tim in Germany insists it's 10. Somebody else says it's 12. Uh, for some reason, we're always in arguments about the actual facts because nobody is talking to us as consciousness in this universe. That's right. And and so Brian Green, right? So he jumps into string theory and starts to present string theory to the world so we can understand what he's working on and and his team of physicists and things. And right there, and if you read his books or listen to him speak, he says there are at least 11 dimensions. And let me explain to you why. Well, you know, and it's just like we've been talking about this for a very long time, but now finally things are starting to mesh together. Linda, your research 
um, that has always combined science, and I'm going to yeah. say it, and the woo, right? <laughs> and, well, well, I've always been a hard-nosed journalist since I graduated from Stanford with a master's in uh, communication, and I did documentaries for uh, Stanford University's Medical Center. Uh, my master's thesis was the Stanford Linear Accelerator Particle, uh, where they were for the very first time, if it's hard to believe, I was at Stanford from 1966 to 68, getting my master's degree. And my master's thesis was working with physicists who were trying to see if they could capture uh, on film some of the particle particle relationships that they were getting at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. But more than that, they wanted to bring to bear the digital world and have computers do the analysis of the particle bombardment that was so laborious. That was how we'll call it the new age of uh, getting into computers and, and advanced science. It was all taking place in a strange way in those two years when I was there. Right. And when I left, all of the work, I went to work for KNBC as a reporter in Los Angeles, and I was covering everything. And then I went to uh, work at WCVB in Boston for the ABC station to do all medical programming for two years, medical, uh, all kinds of diseases, surgery, uh, anything dealing with medicine. And then they assigned me to do a whole series on science and I was working with uh, scientists at MIT and Harvard. It was exciting as can be. And uh, I was married at the time and my husband was hired by Time Inc. And uh, the assignment was in Denver. And I became director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver. And my assignment there was to uh, concentrate on Colorado's astronaut training program. I did a film on that. Uh, on uh, all kinds of things related to Colorado and the nation. And I worked with the governor uh, on a, a live studio show where for 90 minutes, the governor and uh, representatives and myself and an audience, uh, we were dealing with issues that were very important at that time in Colorado. So when the newspapers have headlines in September of 1979. I had graduated from Stanford in 68. So in a decade, I had worked at the NBC, ABC, now CBS, I'm director of special projects. And I am working all the time in science, medicine, the environment. Those are my beats and I'm bringing all new stuff constantly to the work I was doing in Denver. And so I became extremely interested in headlines in the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. Right. The return of bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. Right. right. And I approached that with exactly the same mind, mm -hmm. the same questions, the same uh, protocols that I would use if I were going to investigate a new disease. And when you go from the very first two weeks of trying to get a, some kind of a, uh, like a, you need a landscape to start out when you're going to do any documentary or film, what is it that you're trying to find out and what are the facets that you're going to have to investigate? And it was so clear that I needed to get law enforcement and get them to tell me what they thought was happening because of the bloodless, trackless nature. How in the world could there be a 2,000 pound bull lying in dust with an ear, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals, and rectum cord out, and there's not one track around the body? And that's where in those first two weeks, I'm being confronted with hard physical data, talking with sheriffs, ultimately going up to see Sheriff Tex Graves, and he is the sheriff who cut right to the heart of everything. Linda, the perpetrators of these animal mutilations are creatures from outer space. Okay, and let me as I told you before, when, he, when his <laughs> words were in the air, and I'm standing three feet in front of him, and we're looking at each other eye right. to eye, right. it was like... Uh, 
it was like an a char, a electric fence. My entire body instantly felt like I was touching an electric fence. It was electrical. There was a slight pain to it. It was my entire body. And as I look back at that from now, my 81st revolution around the sun. Right. And at that point, it was 1979. And I think I was 40 something. That what I think was occurring is that my soul, my essence, as a life form in a conscious universe that is conscious and interactive with all the consciousnesses in it, I somehow caught up to, at that very moment, my destiny on the timeline. Right, right. It was, right. It was let, physical. Let, it let was shocking. It was <laughs> profound. And there was no possibility that I was ever, ever conscious, not going to go as deep, as far as I could possibly go in those strange animal mutilations to find as much as I could and keep reporting it. And tonight <laughs> is another hour of the same 44 years. Yes, I know. I've been trying to answer this. But, but Linda, okay, can I get a question in? I just want one question tonight. Just <laughs> let me get one in. But Linda, how does one go from an established, pragmatic, scientific mindset uh, as an investigative journalist with a, a full education behind you? How do you go from that and then jump into the woo? There uh, isn't you know, woo. Well, you know what but I'm saying. No, there is no woo to animals, cattle, deer. Reindeer, that's, that's kangaroos, a, marmots, a, goats, sheep, antelopes. They, this has happened to animals, dozens of types of animals completely around this planet. The kangaroos in Australia have the same excisions that are bloodless yes. as the cattle and the horses. This is pure. You couldn't have anything. That's not be my more, question. No, that's wait. Question. But you couldn't have anything be more physical. Right. More absolutely in your face. Here's the data. And that's what I reinforced by going to work with John uh, Altshuler, who was a pathologist, hematologist. And I work with him on dozens where I went out into the field. He provided the formalin solution. I would get the excisions that could be the sheriff's and I would label it. If this is the sheriff's cut, here's the mutilator's cut. Here's Linda's cut of those excisions, it would go back in formalin solution so that the hide wouldn't harden. And we would get report after report after report. And it was right there that hard data was being put right in front of us on the microscopes that uh, Dr. Altshuler was looking at these uh, prepared slides and finding that there was high heat at the excision lines, and that would explain why so many of the excision lines felt like plastic. They felt hard, they didn't feel soft. It would explain why hemoglobin was not running wherever this hardened heat was applied. But it would never, never, the heat would not explain what was the single greatest mystery to every law enforcement person I talked to every rancher I talked to, and to Dr. Altshuler. How could skilled veterinarians do a necropsy, whether it was a cow, whether it was a bull, whether it was a steer, there's no excisions on the chest or at the abdomen, but they now do the necropsy, maybe in the field or back at the veterinarian office, and they open up the mutilated animal that has an ear, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals, and rectal tissue taken. Now right. they're opening up the animal. They are opening up the animal. There was no surgical cut. They are opening it up to examine the internal organs. And they find that a liver is missing. A gallbladder is missing. Bladder is missing. 
organs are missing inside of the abdomen where they were there they're the ones that are opening it up and find the missing organs and the greatest one of all that happened several times and dr altschuler uh agreed with me and a dr miller at rose medical center that this was what separated all of the animal mutilation phenomena from everything that could possibly be a mundane human explanation right open up the chest a whole heart is missing inside of grown cattle they are approximately 9 by 11 by 13 or some variation on those numbers they're large and whole hearts they are not there they're not in the chest and that they the pericardium that surrounded the heart has collapsed and there is no blood there's no blood in the arteries there's no blood in the jugular vein there's no blood down in the chest there's no blood on the pericardium and there's no blood on the ground and no blood in the ground ever in right, the right, what right. we'll call the true real animal mutilations and so when you ask me how did i go from a decade of hard-nosed medical science environment documentaries news reporting to animal mutilations it's exactly the same thing I wanted to work with scientists. I wanted to uh, get pathology uh, tests. And that's what I did. And as we kept gaining all of the information, then I end up having ranchers say, I want you to know that the night before I found this mutilated animal, I was standing out in the front yard of my house and I was looking up at the sky and there was this light and Linda this light put a beam down into the pasture no. <clears throat> and that the ranchers I've talked with half a dozen people who were eyewitnesses and they said they were so frightened that even though it's their pasture, it's their cattle. In that case, it was cattle, right? They go back in their farmhouse. They close and lock the doors. They wait until the sun comes up. <laughs> they walk back to the pasture. They right. know exactly where that beam came down, just like the beams in, out in Rendlesham Forest in a strange right. way. Right, right. And, but, but these are big enough to hold an animal that can rise into the beam or be lowered. And in this particular case, the first interview I did was a rancher who had gone, he had seen the uh, beam come down into the pasture, scared and didn't come back till the sun came up and right where he had seen the beam is one of his cattle, ear, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals, rectum, cord out, lying right where in the night he had seen the, the beam come down where the animal was. When you get into those discussions and the idea of a beam that can either carry a heavy 2,000 pound bull up in it into some kind of a craft and then lower the animal mutilated back down onto the ground. That is now where we cross into the physics and the technologies of UFOs, not humans. Humans do not have neutralizing gravity beams or they didn't in 19... 66, 67, 68, animal mutilations actually started be, being reported as early as 1961 in places like the San Luis Valley. So there was a body of what we'll call not very much talked about information. But by 79, when I started investigating, it was all over the planet. And they, it was the size and the scope of these cases. And another one of those uh, kind of a, a, one of those interviews that haunts you. And in the animal mutilations, this was one. And it was with a Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Calgary. And they told me, it, one of the men that I was talking to, he said, we we know this cannot be human. And we 
would like to ask you if you would report to us how many cases you find in which specific molars are missing in the teeth, because we have not reported this. We have not let any media know in Canada about the missing teeth. And we have seen your film, your documentary, A Strange Harvest, and we know that you are reporting what we have concluded, but we don't want it to be public. They said those words to me. And they said, so if you would agree to let us know if you are finding missing molars, we are building a case that that is happening here in uh, the Calgary region. And we would like to know if you find it in Colorado or other cases. So this was an example of where the law enforcement side of it is saying to an investigative reporter and TV producer, help us get track of physical evidence that is highly strange, but let's not report it so that we don't have people muddying the waters by attacking. And I experienced a lot of that eventually where I would get phone calls from people who say, we've seen your reporting. We know that you are doing honest work. We understand the details. Want you to know about X, Y, and Z, but we will not uh, talk to you on camera. That also happened a lot. And then eventually, when HBO came to me and said that they wanted to do a document, have me contract with them, that I would do a documentary for HBO broadcast about not just animal mutilations, the whole bigger picture. And we called it UFOs, the ET factor. And I wrote a script, a whole script with scenes. That's something that I've always been able to do so that they, the people putting up the money at HBO could see where what I would do. They loved the script and I start working, have signed a contract and what happens? I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z and they all get blocked. And that is now the story where uh, I went back to New York uh, to talk about what I was learning with Peter Gerson and uh, uh, Richard Doty and these people about going to an air base where there had been mutilations, a UFO landing, uh, something that looked like lasers, and that we would recreate and that, uh, that I would be also shown and allowed to use film of a Holloman Air Force Base landing, pre-arranged uh, April 25th, 1964, and that I would be allowed to show film of the disc landing and a large-nosed, ropey-headed dressed ET coming out of a craft, meeting with uh, a science type and military types and an exchange of which we gave back dead bodies to them and they gave us technology. And the, you know that that's the Emmenager story, that there are lots of facets of it, but I'm going all the way back to uh, March of 1983. All of that was told to me that I would be able to tell in this film. And then all of it gets blocked. And that was the where HBO said, unless you can bring us the president of the United States, the vice president, the secretary of uh, defense, uh, all of these people, we cannot authorize funding. You can continue to do the work, but we will not authorize funding unless you can bring to us top government confirmation of the UFOs, the ETs being real. In other words, they wanted they, the they whole wanted, enchilada broken right. open. Lin, Linda, uh, they wanted something from the White House, didn't they? I mean, they wanted... They, they wanted that. an official break. Right. They wanted what you, I, and everybody who's going to be at Parapod, everybody who's going to be at Portal to Ascension, everybody who's going to be a contact in the desert and was at Conscious Life, we want the truth out. 
We want the whole planet to know what I and a few others have been hearing behind the scenes, so to speak, from pe people in military and in government and in medicine and in aerospace who have been telling me for 44 years, extraterrestrial biological entities have been manipulating DNA in already evolving species on this planet for at least, uh, and then that's where you can draw the line at 45,000 years for Neanderthal to cro or wherever you want to draw the line. Mm -hmm. Genetic manipulation of life forms on this laboratory earth is one story. Which non-humans are the controllers of various experiments? That's a whole nother huge facet. The relationship of power brokers in the evolution of earth going back to the time of Mesopotamia, going back as far as the Anunnaki coming forward, those were power brokers that would be in the category of other intelligence that were interacting with and manipulating DNA on a planet that has been used as a laboratory to create many different species. Jump to Linda, 1979 to today. The animal mutilations, from the best information that I could possibly describe, they have been the harvest of fluids and tissues in order to provide specific, well, let, let's just say ingredients, whether it's uh, fluid or tissue, ingredients that are sustenance for a particular gray type, and that there are all kinds of needs and that we're dealing with a lot of different intelligences and that our planet has been a laboratory, a place where thousands and thousands and thousands of genetic manipulations could be done in order to make different life forms. And that we are only waking up in now the 22nd century as if the next big break open, I hope, will be the web telescope being used to report a biological signature and that if they will just start getting into biological signatures and let that lead to what our government has known since World War II. Let me let me terrestrial biological entities have been on this planet in this solar system for at least 278 million years. And we are the babies just waking up. So what's the update with a uh, uh, Trappist one? Well, two it was two full years ago uh, was the first communication that I had through an aerospace source that, well, it, it, uh, let me put the date. I can't quite remember when it unfurled. It probably wasn't full two years. This was a statement to me when we were getting ready to launch web and then more information after. But I've known about the use of it for quite a while, that they wanted to see if they could have the web, everything would be operational. And then ultimately, the idea was that they would be able to report, there was a recent report just in the last week or so, planetary atmospheres, and that they could then use the web with its ability, its advanced ability, to aim at certain solar systems, and that they would be able to discuss what would be uh, atmospheres around planets, that that was one of the hopes that uh, web would be able to do. If what I was told is that web would be able to also confirm if there were biological signatures in the uh, climate atmosphere, the atmospheric uh, constituents around a planet. Now, a biological signature doesn't mean that it's a humanoid. A biological signature would be the first confirmation of something that we would put in the category of biological life that they still have not reported even on Mars, right? Mm -hmm. 
they come up and say, this looks like the way a fungi would work or this or this, but nothing has been put into even biological signature on Mars. Trappist, this uh, information that came to me, I think of it as a two full years ago, it may not be quite that far back, that Webb, they knew that Trappist has these seven planets, seven Earth-like planets, and that the fourth one from the sun has water, watery and rocky substances very much like Earth. And that I have had other sources who said they already know that there is a civilization interacting with or has bases on in the Trappist system. And that what Webb could do is pure science. We, we get breaking news, um, atmosphere on X planet at the Trappist-1 solar system, very uh, Earth-like planet, and it is showing a biological signature that that's what could happen. And then from there, biological signature would then be debated and analyzed and talked about uh, scientists and news uh, around the planet. And then they would either decide that they would then open up more information about actual civilization or just leave it biological signature for another year or so while they keep trying to, what should we say, Jimmy, at this point? It's been so schizophrenic. The sense last year was that the government was finally getting ready uh, through that, uh, what now is called Arrow office to at least open up a lot more about pilot interactions mm -hmm. with things that were doing physical uh, physical speeds, stopping on a dime, 90 degree turns. Humans cannot do that. And Lou Elizondo and others described the observables that included that going 12,000 miles an hour, stopping in the air. Humans cannot do that. And or going 12,000 miles an hour and then doing a 90 degree turn. Humans cannot do that. And those are multiple observed observables of the UFO phenomena for what? At, since at least World War II. Mm -hmm. So we are right now in March of 2023, still in a planet that humans are fighting each other in the terrible Ukraine. Technologies are available and hidden that have been provided through our relationship with non-humans like the tall whites and the Nordics and the greys. And we thought, I did, I thought surely this will happen. They will open this up in April of 2023 and we will have a biological signature. And at last, all humans who have had straightforward experiences with other beings can begin to slowly be heard as credible ear witnesses, eyewitnesses, and we will be introduced to allies and we will finally, finally join this universe in where the brain of a human and a galaxy and a universe are made to resonate with each other. Roger Penrose, I know, would agree with that statement. Instead, it feels like something is retracting again. It feels like we are coming up into April with everything should have been a go to at least get out the information that would lead to the, there's 168 civilizations that just at this end of the Milky Way galaxy is what I understand. Right. And if we come up again to another screeching halt, like the man, uh, Smith Jones at Upper Hayford, he and two men are just 
a few yards underneath a huge triangle. They all three know that they were, it was there. They saw the, whatever you want to call it, the electrostatic material that was going on the bottom. They knew that there was not one sound that this craft just like popped in. Those men, those women who have been in those situations, so many of them, hundreds of them that have communicated with me and continue to communicate, and I have to protect them. Why are we having to protect the truth and truth tellers? Why can this not be the spring when they finally start telling the truth? And that's why none of this is woo-woo, Jim. No, yeah, none no, of it is woo woo. It's no, never been woo woo. I use I use woo as a as a as a blanket to cover everything. But my but if we go back to my question, at which I'm not going to do, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I don't, don't want to. Uh, no, 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 no. I want to stay right where we are because uh, a few things did happen this week that I, I found very interesting. One, we have uh, uh, the the paper written by Avi Loeb and uh, uh, Kirkpatrick about, and, and the thing is, <laughs> uh, and the thing that they they stated in there, and I just really, really um, um, am, am perplexed. It's not the statement about a mothership dropping off probes. That's pretty, you know, and for Avi to write that. Um, you have to ask the most important question, which is why? What is Avi basing this on? He's a very smart guy. He doesn't just write stuff to write it. He has people coming to him like I have people coming to me right. that That's are frustrated and they know we are in a universe that is full and teeming with other consciousness Correct. and that they are trying to find how do we crack it open without causing hysteria in some populations right. and boredom in other populations. Populations because there are going to be so many people that you and I know who will say, I told you so. Yeah, I know. Exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. So we had that this week. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back to it. I'm not going to let that go. Um, but uh, number two, uh, just yesterday, James Webb, uh, uh, the, the team there announced uh, it's not the first biosignatures that they have discovered, but it was the most on a single planet to date. They found five biosignatures on one planet. I don't have the name of the, the number designation of the planet in front of me, but they found water. They found oxygen. They found carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Right, and but a biosignature is, is something that would uh, tie it directly to biological life. You're that, talking about ingredients for biological life. That is correct. They, they reported that. I'm talking about reporting biological life. But isn't it exciting, Linda? Yes. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, the way that Linda and I are talking right now, this is how we do it <laughs> over champagne uh, late into the night. This is not some uh, you know, Jimmy and Linda. No, no. This is how Linda and I just talk. <laughs> And we're doing that tonight. But Linda, isn't that exciting to have those five? So the system well, is and maybe that is a, going to indicate that they're finally going to open this up using the web exactly as it was mm -hmm. described to me a couple of years ago. Right. And what a great thing if they would do it. Oh, my God. To give this whole planet more hope. Right now, doesn't the planet feel like it's being sucked into a timeline with the Ukrainian and the, the China and Russia and that everybody is worried we're going to have a nuclear war on this planet as insane as that would be? And there's something about talking with scientists, looking at the web, they're finding that there are atmospheres around planets. And what if they do and can report a biological signature? Could that completely change this feeling that we're being shut in and taken down 
to a nuclear war just because of testosterone people who want to fight with nukes. Right, 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 right. It's uh, it, it, it's not going to happen. <laughs> I, just, I just I be, well I, I believe that our ET brothers and sisters would would step in. Number one, they need us to evolve and we can't evolve if we blast ourselves back into the stone age so i just don't believe and the other thing is i just think that cooler heads are going to prevail well may that, i ask you a question that bothers sure. me sure why do you think over the last forty-five thousand years when neanderthal cross-faded to cromanian homo sapien sapien and now we have homo sapien sapien that is evolving and now we are at 2023, and we are the current crop of Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapiens. Mm -hmm. Why, during that whole period of the last 45,000 years, why were humans kept separated from the truth of a conscious, vast universe filled with other life forms? I don't. I don't what agree was, with that. Yeah, what was to be gained by power brokers yes. that were ETs like the Anunnaki on this planet, right? Mixing and matching DNA, creating a whole bunch of different species, and when they made Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien, somebody decided they are not to know anything about other life forms. They will look at us as angels, they will look at us as something that is not earthly. And once that began, we are now the inheritors of a very strange editing, all of the history of humanity. Why were we never told then? And why is it so difficult now to just tell what seems like an obvious truth? Yeah, that it's the universe is full of life. It's a, it's a great question, but I don't agree with you. And let me, and so I'll answer the question and let me explain. All right. Um, I believe that until very recently in the last couple of thousand years uh, and probably the last hundred years, but up until that point, I think that we got along. I, I, I don't think that there were any barriers between us and E.T., and the reason is this. If you go back to uh, 5,000 years ago, Linda, 3,000 years ago, and um, you uh, have your little village and somebody comes over from another village that you've never seen before and they make the 50-mile trek, you have met somebody new, a new culture. And, and that's what, and when something came out of the sky, it, it wasn't uh, from space. It wasn't ET. It was just somebody new to meet. And I don't think that there were barriers there. I don't think that there was any angst. It was just uh, something new and everybody was discovering stuff. It was only until very recently where this blockade of knowledge has started and I would, I would probably be very confident in saying that it started in 1947. And oh, long and, before that, Hitler yeah. was talking about Aldebaran uh, extraterrestrials helping he him in the 30s. Yeah, but he wasn't covering it up. He wasn't. Oh, I think they yeah. were. Well, possibly, but uh, what I'm, I'm just talking about the timeline. Okay, so I'm just saying, uh, just until very recently. Um, this is something I think that before that, no, I don't think that there was a big deal when well, the, when the, you, when the you... Nuremberg woodcuts were done, right. W was there a big freak out on that? No, no. I just think. Of, I don't know that anybody knows exactly what happened to produce that woodcut, but let me ask you, do you think that what we have gotten in carved stone uh, with the language of the Anunnaki and the mm -hmm. Sumerians, mm -hmm. the description carved in stone is that Enki and Enlil and Anu, they were and positioned themselves as controlling gods. That's right. Yeah. And no humans, they, they argued 
about the poor chattel humans. And remember, it was uh, they, the humans were uh, not useful. They, uh, Enlil wanted to destroy humans. Mm -hmm. And Enki ends up arguing, and that is the so-called famous war that might have produced the Trinitite glass in the Sahara and parts of uh, India that might relate to something that was releasing a, like an atomic bomb uh, back in the time of the Anunnaki. And the very fact that there would be such a war between Enki and Enlil about humans, then it seems to me they were basically saying, we don't want the humans to know us at what we are, our level. We just want the humans mm -hmm. to do the work for us that we need them to do. Yeah, but I don't think it was a cover up. And uh, they certainly created us. And if you read in, in one of Sitchin's books um, where he translates one of the Sumerian tablets, it says right there, we are going to modify the DNA so we could have Linda Moulton Howe in the year 2023. It's right there. It's on a Sumerian stone in, in cuneiform writing. <laughs> But, but see, here the thing. I, I still I, want to meet the ETs <laughs> that are interacting with this planet. But but Linda, um, I, I don't think, I, I think history is going to look back and, and show that you and I and others were right. Yes. In that, in that, um, the, uh, the age of us, which let's say the modern version of us is 200,000 years old, right? That's what anthropologists are going to suggest today, that we just appeared 200,000 years ago. But No, no, no. In no, terms right. of Neanderthal, which was before Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, sapien, that you can look this up. The crossfade in Neanderthal to Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, sapien was approximately 45,000 years ago. Yes. That that's, humanoid that, form. That's correct. It that, goes I, back longer that that's that's correct but that's not my point so let me get to my point then you respond <laughs> which is this linda that um this number this two hundred thousand year number that um is is thrown around i think a little bit too freely and then you turn around and you read the work of sitchin and what is on those sumerian tablets the timelines match and I don't think that that is a coincidence. I, I, I don't. And I don't have a better explanation um, where science wants to say that it was all luck and, and lightning struck a crystal in a creek and, and DNA just formed. You know, no. That, no, no, that's no, not. No, it's not true at all. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and so and I remember hearing... Richard Dawkins, I guess I just dropped his name, say those words. And I'm thinking to myself, how can you try to pretend to be an intellectual, a scientist, um, somebody that's a forward thinker, and say something as stupid as that, that it was just luck? Well, no, the odds of, does, does he even understand how many digits we're talking about? Of, of luck, of, of odds, of something like that happening just by chance? No, there's something else intervened. I don't know what intervened, but something did. And it's that simple. And so when we go back to those, um, I think that's part of what the cover-up may be, that if, if it is disclosed, if E.T. comes down, Linda, and, and the ship lands, and they march down, and they go, okay, where's Linda Moulton Howe? We need to talk to her. And so, you know, they you step up, and they go, okay, so this is actually what happened. This, 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 and the, the government's going to have to answer for that because they probably know all of this. Oh, of course, they do. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, you're going right to the, the whole reason, cover-ups for so long, and why all of these uh, poor guys like uh, Smith Jones, you keep your mouth shut. You never, if you do, we will take your uh, bank account. You will never have it. all these threats to all these people. Mm -hmm. It's because 
the government of the United States was not in control of anything that the UFO ETs were doing. They caught on that there were abductions. They knew that there were animal mutilations. They knew that there were all kinds of interactions going on with the earth that they couldn't control, they couldn't stop, that they would have to introduce the ETs if, if they chose at the time when they realized that animal mutilations and human abductions and a whole lot of other things were the work of the ETs, they didn't want to tell humans that. And here's where you get to where things are right now today. What is wrong with telling the whole truth as an evolution and no, saying, yes, we knew X, Y, and Z a hundred years ago? but we couldn't understand how it related to uh, A, B, C. And today they could open up so many facets that might even relate to new energy sources and all kinds of things that they keep hiding because if they bring them out, then they would have to introduce the ETs and they've been trying to have their cake and eat it too. They want all the advanced technology. They want the advanced weapons. They want the propulsion system. We're going on craft that can go out 50 light years and that we've had a, a secret space force that's been doing that. And if they tell everybody the whole truth, some people think it's too much of a shock to the human system. I argue truth in and of itself is healing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, we're definitely at that point now. I think that most of us, as our ability to understand uh, continues to grow, right, yeah. uh, that I think most of the planet knows that there is, I'm going to use a bad word, there's a shit ton of life out there, right? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's all over the place, Linda. And it's here's just the, say the universe is teeming with consciousness. It is. It, 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 it absolutely is. And, and then this is the third story I wanted to bring up to you. Talk about exciting times. Uh, as, as you are aware, two days ago, uh, uh, it was uh, the, the Japanese uh, return of an asteroids, uh, um, uh, I'm going to say, uh, scoops, um, produced amino acids. And not only that, niacin, vitamin B3. And we are talking about the ingredients that are needed for RNA. RNA being the redheaded stepchild of DNA. We don't talk about RNA enough. RNA is just as complex and as crazy as and as important as DNA in that RNA gives DNA its instructions, right? right? And, and so without RNA, there's no us. But what this has revealed, and we're going to do it again in September when Bennu Hayabusa yeah. 2 uh, yeah. from the asteroid Bennu, that'll be in September. And we've already known uh, and have found uh, complex sugars, simple sugars, on meteorites before. But now it turns out, it's turning out, that if we go out to an asteroid, we're going to find the building blocks of life on these asteroids that are impacting planets throughout the universe. And I would argue, Linda, this is some of the biggest news um, in the history of mankind. But number two, I think that it represents um, that DNA is as universal in the universe as consciousness that these simple things are deposited everywhere and that DNA would be the same at, in Zeta Reticuli as it is here in our Milky Way and certainly in our solar system. And I think it's a very, very big deal and a big announcement. Well, and it's like a facet of where we started about the web being used to Thank aim you. at a planet in Trappist and talk about the atmosphere of that planet, a watery planet, and then and breaking news, biological signature. <laughs> what is going to be the definition of those words, biological signature? And so one story and what you're talking about, they're, they're kind of facets of where we could be leading now 
that piece by piece, discovery after discovery with the web and what we are doing with uh, exploring in asteroids, that could be what will be used for that big headline, we're not alone, which is what I hope. And it's the question on the timeline right now, do they do the power brokers feel that this would be a good time in April of 2023, in a sense, to kind of deflect the world and the energy and the attention that seems to be building up into the China and Russia and the United States again, almost on a war footing. Would this announcement tend to start reducing that because news would then start going more and more into, well, what are UFOs? Are right. there extraterrestrials here? Are there extraterrestrials in a base inside of the Ganymede moon in Jupiter, which there is? It's like maybe this could release some of that horrible intensifying Pressure. energy that yes. is uh, building toward war yes. and that this alone this year, if we can get the, this news out into world headlines could maybe give people everywhere a kind of new spring. It, it, it kind of reminds me, and, and I agree with you. Um, and, and I'm going to get to my number four here in just a second. It reminds me of Ronald Reagan's speech at the UN, right? Yes. And and I uh, I'm not talking about an alien invasion, of course, but I am certainly uh, referring to something off planet that would force us into forgetting about our differences and our grievances and bring us together as Earthlings right. and realize that you know what uh, we are here together. And we are representing, do we really want, I mean, honestly, for um, E.T. Uh, to show up here and see us literally firing bows and arrows at each other? I mean, how nukes yeah. destroying oh. this gorgeous, wonderful yeah, 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 laboratory yeah, yeah. planet. I'm embarrassed with that. You know how it is when you have people come over to your house. Well, maybe not you, but um, uh, people come over and uh, they a surprise visit and you've got dirty dishes in the sink. <laughs> right. And, and how embarrassed you. Well, that's what I, I'm kind of embarrassed for our planet right now that I know that we're much better than this. I, I just know that. I know that deep down, we're all pretty much good people. There's a lot of uh, there are bad apples everywhere. But by and large, as human beings, we're pretty damn cool, Linda. We really are. And I'm just embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for us that we've got some some yahoos on this planet that really want to make us look, you know, like doofuses. And we're not. We're I, I just don't think we're that way. Well, Reagan, you have to also add this because this is the context in which he spoke at the U.N. Uh, he had been given a briefing by his new CIA uh, dr uh, director, Casey at Camp David in March after he had been elected about UFOs and ETs. And I've done a whole presentation about it and have talked with people. I've talked with one man who uh, he knew a colleague who was there at this meeting and said, you're reporting the truth. The context of giving Reagan information about the five different types of ETs included that trontoloid, the fifth in the bottom of the list, T-R-A-N-T-A-L-O-I-D, -T -T trontoloid, defined for Reagan as a tremendous threat, an insect at Epsilon Eridani, only 10.5 light years from Earth, very close, and that these insects, they had learned from uh, other ETs that they were dealing with, the um, archaloids and the quadloids and others that would include the Nordics and the tall whites, that these insects are a threat, that the insects are a threat everywhere, and that they wanted Reagan to know about this ET threat. And then it appears that since that 
briefing with Reagan, somebody made a decision that everything having to do with UFOs and ETs and other threats and all of it had to go underground and not be discussed. But he gave that speech at the UN and he was referring to it. If we had a threat from outer space to this planet, wouldn't it bring us all together? We're not talking about just the insects. We're talking about a universe that is teeming with life, that there might be 168 different solar system civilizations at just this end of the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. And if only one of them, if the insects are the ones that everybody else is worried about, I've been told by two people who have uh, worked in the Pentagon, and they have said, as long as the tall whites and at least one of the types of Nordics, they are so advanced, as long as they have taken a vested interest in helping us, the insects are not going to defeat them, that we already have a protection. Why can't that be announced to the planet as one complex introduction, just as Reagan said in the UN, that we have allies. We had allies before we ever were publicly told on earth the truth. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And 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 he that the speech at the UN, that wasn't the only time Ronald Reagan gave that speech. He that's gave right. Time. Three times he no, eight, 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 eight. Oh, I didn't know that. I knew eight. of three. Eight. <laughs> oh, I just taught Linda Moulton House something. Yeah. But, eight. but uh, before um, I let you go, what a great celebration tonight. Commercial free, uh, just a conversation uh, between friends. Amazing conversation, Linda. Uh, and I can't, uh, champagne's on me next week. Okay. And, uh, and uh, let's hope you guys. For all of us, for the whole planet, for all 8 billion souls, that there is a decision, I hope it's April 23rd, that the the government is going for, they're just going to announce Webb is showing a biological signature on the fourth planet of the TRAPPIST-1 system, seven Earth-like planets, and that's the open. That's the beginning. I, I got to tell everybody, I asked Linda out on a date earlier today. She turned me down. <laughs> straight up, straight up, turned me down. She said, no, Jimmy, not going to do it. Not yeah, gonna do it. I, I've got to, uh, my time, no, I have not, to focus no, on all the people who want to tell me their firsthand stories. Don't throw me under the bus, but she, <laughs> she turned me down. But Linda, okay, so we've been talking about biosignatures. Now let's talk about technical signatures. And it, James Webb is set up for this too as well. Now looking through an exoplanet's atmosphere and observing and how this is done, this is done with the, the, the light from its uh, sun, its star, and it, 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 the atmosphere gets illuminated and we, we figure out the chemicals and the chemistry that is there. And, and we can also see clouds, by the way. There was a, two days ago, they announced they've, they have seen clouds yes. on an exoplanet. I was like, how? how? Okay, but anyway, it, the ability to look for a technical signature um, is also there. Do you it would think- be maybe something in a radio or X-ray or terahertz or who knows, but Lights. we're talking Lights. frequencies again that would be related to technology. Well, there's that, and there's the possibility of seeing lights on the dark side of a planet from yeah. an illuminated city, That's right? right? That's uh, right. Th- these are all very exciting things. Would you, if a tech signature... Um, now I have been told, uh, from multiple people that work, uh, with the James Webb, some of them, you know, and we c- both communicate with these same sources, but they have all expressed to me, um, and by the way, Linda and I have talked about this before. I'm going to get her response for the audience, uh, 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 publicly tonight. They have all told me the same thing that the James Webb, uh, group, 
is international. This is not a United right. States thing. No, and that's right. If they, if they find a text signature, if they find something uh, as 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 biological that would tip the scales, that the United States won't be able to cover it up, and that they will go public with this. Do you Let's believe? That to, do you believe that to be true? I don't know. I think that the political fractures on the planet right now are so serious in so many directions. Um, I, I hope that the scientists would prevail for honest, honest reporting. And one thing to keep in mind also, we have lights in cities on the surface of the earth. But I know that the tall whites inhabit a base that has been described to me as amazing inside of Ganymede. And there have been other sources who have talked about how so many ETs, they will have huge bases that are inside. They have learned how to uh, have a compatible relationship with a variety of planets and moons by being based inside, which then helps with anything that would be incoming, whatever the relationship with the sun. Right. And so it may be that at Trappist, maybe one piece of one planet that maybe there would be lights, but if there aren't, that doesn't mean that the planet or planets would could have advanced intelligences inside of them. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just Trappist it's all the solar systems, that the advanced ETs, um, as one man uh, told me a long time ago, he said, the way I can uh, explain it to you, Linda, the way I understand, when they approach any planet for the first time, that they have huge, gigantic computer technology systems that are analyzing the new, whether it's a moon or a planet that they are approaching, and that they they will be able in this one investigatory pass, they will know where there are huge caverns inside or not. They will know everything about the inside to the outside of the planet or the moon, because that's how they look strategically at solar systems. And that's really important when it comes to what are they going to announce uh, if it is a biological signature and they are looking only at the atmosphere of the planet, that's one level. There's going to be many other levels. And if we would get honesty, uh, uh, real honesty from the scientists on the whatever their first disclosure is, it seems to me that would set a healthy landscape on which to build more and more honest science. That is my own personal hope. If we start getting headlines after headlines after headlines about biological signatures, then it kind of, doesn't it set up like a whole new plane of discussion? And that ETs then come into that as part of the evolution of what we are discovering with the Webb telescope. And to me, that has a different feeling that yeah. cold announcement, right. we're not alone in the universe. Well, it would give us a reason to to be. Yeah. Right? It would give us a. It would give us hope. Yeah. It would give us a reason to look to the future. Right now, um, with uh, uh, the the divisiveness and the fighting and the things that we see going on on this planet, aside from actual wars. Um, that that is just because we're a little bit bored, and we we we've been a little, a little frozen in this period of time. We and we've been on a planet in which the majority of humans are under the thumbs psychologically, politically, militarily right. yes. of a tiny, tiny, tiny group of humans that are the power brokers. That's so right. That that's right. right. That's right. It, it is not a fair planet at this point. No, and and you know, obviously, uh, the entire frigging planet, every single country, um, completely locked down, um, uh, locked in your homes, 
um, going stir crazy, going nuts, spending way too much time on social media, picking fights. And, and I'm talking about the globe. It wasn't one country. It wasn't one city. It was everybody. And, and we're talking and, about pandemic time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so uh, we we need to come out of this on the other side with a better understanding of of not only uh, how to try to start ignoring borders, but differences and things and 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 all of the angst. Let's get rid of it. You know, Can we have I... we have an opportunity here, Linda. And what would what would kickstart all of that? Can I insert we're here? Alone. We're not alone in the universe. That right. would start it all. Let Let me insert here what I've always thought was one of the most powerful paragraphs that any abductee ever said to me. And this was a scientist uh, on the East Coast who was uh, pulled up out of his father's car. The whole family was in the car. The father was driving. Uh, the uh, son was in the passenger seat in the front. In the back was his mother, uh, the driver's wife, a sister and her husband. And these five people had been in Manhattan celebrating the younger man who is the abductee in this. Uh, not that he knew that at the time, but that's what this leads to. Uh, they had been celebrating his 32nd birthday and he was doing very well, very bright, had started a, a lab to do water analysis on the East Coast. And they all at the same time see a pulsing red light in the night sky. It was about 2 a.m. And they are talking about what is that red pulsing light? The father pulls over to the shoulder off the freeway. And the son in the passenger's seat leans forward to look up into the window he is outside. He is moving rapidly. Whatever form he is in, it's now looking back. He sees himself still at the position of looking through the window. Mm. He sees his father. He knows his mother and his sister and her husband are in the back seat. but he's moving up and he is in a form that seems to be able to move, to look, to have 360 degree sight. And as he is then his attention, wherever his attention went, it was then he was aware of motion. And then he comes up and said, it was just like I suddenly had a relationship a perspective with this big, huge donut that had red pulsing lights in the middle of it underneath. And I come up for reasons. He said, I'm not in control of what's happening. I don't know why. I come over the top of the donut I come down toward the red pulsing lights. I get to the red pulsing lights. And Linda, the next thing I know, there is a, he, I, I can't remember if he said there were 10 or 12, but they were a type of gray with black slanted eyes. They were in a ring and in the form he is out of body, he is coming down right into the middle of them. And I saw the hypnosis session that he did with this, uh, it was a Bud Hopkins, never went public. He, he, he never wanted anybody to know who he was publicly. And Bud and I and others uh, always respected that. But uh, Bud did a hypnosis session with him. And I got to see this scientist on a sofa, his legs, he was pulling his legs up on the sofa and kicking, kicking out, saying, I'm trying to stop. He's trying to stop his body from coming down into this ring of the, these beings that would be like a typical kind of gray with the black slanted eyes. And from that moment for what must have been in terms of earth time, hours could have been seconds to the aliens because we're all learning about how they manipulate time. Sure. And, uh, but realistically, it was really ours. And what I'm coming to is that he went into a description of being oriented by these gray scientists 
about the truth of the universe that we are actually in. And this is a paragraph from an interview that I did with him. Quote, our universe is paired to another one. And they showed him, like when Betty Hill said that the, the black-eyed gray took her over to what looked like a hologram and there were stars in there. And he asked Betty, which one is your planet? And she said, I have no idea. And he said, well, if you don't know where you are, how would you expect me to show you where we are now? And that it was a holographic projection of a section of the universe that Betty Hill talked with him. Okay, now we're with the scientists uh, outside of New York and he's in, interacting and they show him, as he said, three-dimensional and, and that he's looking at our universe and then they showed that it had a pair. There was another universe and that what humans didn't understand is that this, there isn't just one universe. There are many universes. Our universe is paired to another one. They go together, two universes, which is completely opposite of this one, whatever that means. There, there, the skies in the one universe are glowing white with dark suns. Colors are indescribable and iridescent and time flows to the past. Like a conveyor belt at the moment of death in our universe, we move through a tunnel into the mirror universe where it is all light. And there time moves to the past and souls return back here. Wow. Our universe. Wow. Close quote. Wow. Scientist, East Coast. Ooh. Strong. That's strong. I, I love this. I That's would strong. love to sit That's down strong in a huge conference of every extraterrestrial in the Milky Way galaxy, <laughs> yeah, man. have them show us the whole truth. I want to go backwards. And uh, I'm going to go backwards with Linda uh, next Friday night. She's arriving here in LA. Uh, we will be preaching. I'm going to present Linda with uh, the Media Legend Award at the Parapod Festival. That's going to go down Saturday, April 1st in Santa Clarita, Valencia, same city. The links for Parapod are below. If you're in and around L.A. and you want to come hang out yeah. uh, with Linda and I and crack uh, some champagne with us, come on up uh, to Valencia. Come on down to Valencia. The links are below and uh, come and hang out with us. Linda, thank you so much. Well, thank you. This has been fun. And thanks to Tony Sweet for producing the Parapod Tony's the Festival. Tony's, Tony's, Tony's been a part of this community, as you know, yes. for a very long time. And uh, he really, really fights the good fight. And uh, yeah. he's just amazing. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Tony. Absolutely. Linda. And a drop a hug to you, to Tony to everybody who's coming and it's in Santa Clarita Yep. and go uh, to uh, the Parapod website. Do you have that? I do. I do. You I can do. still get tickets. Yep. 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 The links are below. We've got them throughout social media. All right. uh, Linda's got it up. So uh, just come and hang out with us again, Linda. I can't believe 81 trips around the sun. We're about to celebrate 82. This is just incredible to me. You're I want 500 more. You're every ET there is. <laughs> your energy is just infectious. So um, I'll, I, just safe travels. I'll see you in about a week uh, right here in Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Linda. Behave and be well. And congratulations. Thank you. Agape Thank you. love to you and to everyone. The very best, Linda Moulton Howe. Now, um, and thank you. That was straight two hours live and no commercials. That's how I like to do it with Linda. Come and hang out with us next Friday right here in Los Angeles. And uh, that's it. I want everybody to have a great, safe, fun, and amazing weekend. Um, I'm going to do just that. And I just kicked off my weekend with Linda Moulton Howe. Doesn't get any better than that. Earthfiles.com is the website. 
That's where I get all of my information. Fade to Black is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boys, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Everybody have a great, safe, fun, amazing weekend. Go back, Lee Tappy.